Okay. Uh, I'm going to share this one. Okay, folks. So let me put this back now that it's not broken. Okay. So uh, good questions to start with. Um, folks are excited about the fact that you almost get to eat turkey if you celebrate Turkey Day. Um, so we'll we'll have one more um, lecture. Hopefully we'll get through all of exoplanets today. Um, sometimes it's really fun and it might go a little bit into here, but I will ask um, during the lecture tutorial to write down some thoughts. We'll have something that we'll do. And then these probably will be not on the exam, depending on how much material we get through today. And then um, as was pointed out this week here, we do not have in-person class. No classes are allowed to be in-person during this week. This is only finals. And so you have other finals that you're attending to in week 16. That's fine. I'll expect you to be working on them. The questions I guess I have. Oh, wait, why is Zoom not working? Is this working? People online, can you hear me? Six participants. Okay, well, we'll see if it works. <laughs> um, so the question, of course, I have is when do I pass out the final? And when do I get it back? So what is your preference for when the final comes back? What day? Yeah. Any day we finish. Okay, so there's a deadline. Right. Well, what's the last day to you? Because our last day is a Thursday, right? So do you want to turn it in like right now in two weeks? Or would you rather have till Friday? Is the question clear? Let me ask a different way. Let me ask a different way. Let me put the map up. Here is the rest of our lives, right? So that's a Monday, okay? Uh, that's the Friday. Would you prefer, this is final. Would you prefer on the 8th to pass it in during what would be this, during what would be this um, exam for class time? Or would you prefer to turn it in Friday, close of business, five o'clock? Raise your hand for Friday, close of business, five o'clock. Yeah, so unanimously, I think it's better. I, but I'm not, I'm asking you all. Yeah, one Friday, anyone else Friday? Okay, a few Fridays. Okay, all Fridays. We're going to do Friday. So we'll do Friday, close of business. And now the more important question, when you get your exam. What's that? As soon as possible. When you get back from break? Today. Okay, well, I haven't written it. So, no. Um, so, why don't we say, why don't we say I'll give it out this day on the first? And that will give you a week and a day to work on it. Now, what's the surefire, the most, um, what's the easiest way to like drive yourself crazy is to wait a week before you even open it. So the first thing you do when you get the exam, you start looking through every single question and you say, can I answer this? And if you can't, then that's what these office hours are for. Or email or Slack. You can ask me questions. I may not tell you the answer, but I may direct you in the right direction, right? Someone has a question. The questions online? Which Friday? Thinking the ninth. The ninth. I'm going to cry the entire time. Okay, good. Everyone can see that, by the way. Sorry. <laughs> um, so yeah, so um, I will send out an email to this effect shortly. Okay. All right. So let's go back to today. Any final questions on this? There will be two more open houses on Monday after Turkey Day and Thursday during finals week. Um, oh, sorry, one more thing. You may have noticed in your grade that you have a one 
in the place of the observatory report. That just means to me, this is a way of me identifying who has done it and who has not. So I see, like if you haven't turned it in yet and you have a one, that just means it's a note that I have record that you were there, but I don't have it. So if you already turned it in, just remind me and I'll find it somewhere. Yeah. That's the only one I looked at. So your <laughs> so the one that says weighted is the only one that's meaningful because lecture tutorials um they make up a fraction of your grade as is in the syllabus. But unfortunately for Canvas, Canvas doesn't know how to weight individual assignments. And maybe a smart professor could do that. I haven't figured out how Canvas will do it. So because we don't know how many lecture tutorials we're going to end up being able to squish in, I put it into a totally different spreadsheet. I take whether or not you did it or not, and then that goes into my spreadsheet, and you get a certain number of points for it. The weighted, the weighted score will be the most accurate as of Sunday afternoon. So if we don't like if that's lower than what we want, but we've done the homework, is it the like that we're making better play? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, so the different components are the lecture tutorial, the homework, the um, midterm, the final, and the observatory. So you have all of those components, you're still unhappy. Um We good? Okay. Um, all right. So what is this? Oh shit, not that. What is this? God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's not what we're gonna do. Oh no, okay, wait, sorry. <laughs> So that is really fun. You can download that for free. It like, lets you see where the stars will be in the future. But that's not what we're using currently. What is this? Sun, right? Looks like the sun, right? Good. But it's not quite the sun. It's a star. Okay. What's that? Planet. Which planet? Mars, Jupiter, something like that? No. Okay, so good. So that's the point of today's lecture. We are looking at planets outside of our solar system. So the other day, if you went to the observatory, we were like really excited that we could see a little faint splotch that was Jupiter. And it kind of puts this into perspective, like, wow, that's okay. Jupiter was kind of boring compared to how amazing this is. This is a planet outside of our solar system going around its parent star, and we can directly see it. So this color that you're seeing from that planet, that is the real color of the planet. Okay. Now we can't see whether or not it has skyscrapers or anything fun, but we're going to put that aside for right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this will be one of the few images we see today that are real. A lot of them are going to be artists and stuff. Um, you also may have noticed that there was a launch. We talked about that on Thursday or something. And they sent this picture. What's that? <laughs> That's art. Yeah. So that's everyone who's ever existed. It's right there. No person has ever died in space. That's me. <laughs> it's <not for> <laughs> um, but it's really cool. I mean, these types of pictures that they're sending. So they, they took them, could see Earth get smaller and smaller and smaller. And then they saw a lot of uh, the moon pictures. I didn't put them in yet because we had another really exciting thing today happen. And that was this. The JWST had a press release for WASP 39B. Anyone see this? This is why I don't open Twitter, but I did open Twitter. And so WASP 39B, we saw this a little bit actually at the very beginning of the semester. And um, I said, okay, we can see carbon dioxide in atmosphere. And they're like, who cares? <laughs> um, and it turns out now they've done the whole thing. And what they were able to show here, and we're not going to be able to really understand this in a meaningful way, but there's water, okay, there's carbon monoxide, there's sulfur dioxide. This is the one that's really interesting. So what does that mean? Sulfur dioxide is something that's not commonly found. You need um, materials, basically water, to interact with the top of the atmosphere. And they think, well, if there is life in this like liquid water atmosphere planet, um, sulfur dioxide would be protecting it from some types of ultraviolet radiation. Okay, this is not a detection of life. 
This is saying this is a necessary precursor. Similar to how ozone protects us, sulfur dioxide is doing that on this planet. Okay? This is evidence of photochemistry. And this is the first one. So um, WASP-39B, they are like looking at all this data. Five papers came out and everyone is really excited in the scientific community at these really beautiful um, colors. <laughs> now, meaningfully to you, no difference. When we talk about exoplanets as a whole, they are going to be a lot of like, woo, but like no impact, okay? Okay, question? But, um, yeah. Why are the carbon monoxide? Uh, because they like to, it, carbon dioxide likes to be broken up, oh, and you get carbon carbon monoxide. Yeah. Yeah. No. Good question. I mean, carbon monoxide we think of typically as a dangerous gas, but it's just a byproduct from um, the destruction of carbon dioxide. Okay. Come on. Um. So let's talk about what we talked about. Direct detection. We saw that. Actual planets. Um, really hard to do. What was the analogy we used for direct detection about how hard it is to do? Like lighting a grapefruit on fire and placing it where? New York, New York City. Good. Okay. Indirect detection, much easier. We can find almost all our planets this way. And we use either the mass or the size. So we used something called astrometric. That one was kind of shitty because you had to watch the star wobble around on the sky. And that's not where we find most of the planets. We used Doppler technique. We have this nice lecture tutorial that we're going to come back and finish today that looks at the way that the planet um, influences the star, pushes it closer or away from us. And we can see that because we can see the stars quite well. And we can infer the mass of the planet. And then if we get lucky, we get this thing called the transit technique. And we're going to talk about that today. This was the first um, uh, exoplanet, 51 Pegasus B. Is this a real image? No. Artist conception. Um, first exoplanet to be detected around a sun like star. We'll talk about what the first exoplanet of all was, and it wasn't found around a normal star, it found a very weird star. Okay. So, what's the transit technique? Analogy. Yeah, I'm trying to word this. It's uh the brighter the, the brighter the star is, we know uh how bigger the planet is. Okay, so there's a, a brightness component and the size of the planet. I'm hearing those together, right? The way I like to think about it is by looking at say this light and passing my hand in front of the light. Right? And however much it goes down, the brightness goes down, tells me what the size of the planet. Is that what you meant? Yeah. Yeah. Good. So let's think about that in the context here. Okay. So here's this nice, um, what really well drawn picture. And it has which graph represents my hand passing in front of a candle or the light, whatever you want. Okay. So the one at the top that's supposed to be flat, the one on the top right that's supposed to go down to the right, the one in the middle that's supposed to have a perfectly curved in the middle, or is this one that has two lumps? You know when you're ready to go. Let's vote on three, two, one. Okay, I didn't get anyone that time. All right, so it's all, yeah, you're all right, it's three. Okay. All right, so that's the transit technique. Transit technique is straightforward. Um, planet passes in front of the star. So here's the planet, this nice little color. And at point one, it's out here, and it's not diminishing the star's brightness at all. And then as it begins to encroach, it makes it go down a little bit, and then it's fully in front of the star, that's point three, and that's as deep as it gets. There's a secondary eclipse, but we're not going to talk about that either in the exam or probably for the rest of your life. Okay. So the point that I wanted to make here, though, is this does give you the size. And the size is really important because if I have the size, the radius, and the mass, I get what important quantity? Density. The density. What does the density of a planet tell me? Yeah. 
Yeah, that's right. Yeah, tell me what it's made of. So we noticed in our solar system, there was two types of large bodies. What were they? Yeah, I'd say rocky and gas, right? So terrestrial and Jovan is correct, right? But if, if I want to use this analogy of what they're made of, say I have rocky planets and I have gas, gas planets, and they have a giant difference in density. And now I have all of the tools necessary to tell the difference. Okay. So we sent up something called Kepler, named after the person. Um, and it was really cool. It just had this telescope here um, pointing out that way. And then it would just stare at exactly the same point on the sky. That's the camera that they use there, stuck in the bottom, um, run by students in Colorado. Did they have the uh, nuclear engine on it? No, this one's close. So this one just has, um, if you look here on the right hand side, these solar arrays. So this one's close, orbited right next to us, and it had to be in space. And I'll show you why that, that is in a few seconds. They just looked, um, if you were there on Thursday, I tried to point out something called um, Cygnus, which is the swan, really boring looking, just looked like a, a kite. It looks like that, it looks like that. When you look up tonight, you'll see it right overhead. And this part of the sky, Kepler just stared at for years. Just looking at exactly the same part of the sky, not moving. So just looking, 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 looking. And what it was looking for is looking for stars' brightness to just go down a little bit. Every time that it goes down a little bit, a planet's probably passing in front of it. So if we just look in this area only, we can just count up how many planets we see in that area, and we'll do what scientists do, which would just theorize wildly, wild, wildly about how many planets there are ever else. And that one patch, assume that it tells you about everything else because random each other. So this is a light curve here. These are the brightnesses. This is the data itself. And this is the better version. When you do it on the ground, you have all that atmospheric wiggle. When you go into space, it disappears. So you get a really nice signal. That's a little hard. Maybe I wouldn't be able to see that. That's obvious, right? It's a real data. Okay. And what does the depth of this tell you again? The radius. Radius. Yeah. Okay. So here's another version. Okay. Uh, normal brightness. Dip. Okay. Normal brightness. Maybe dip. And that's a secondary transit. We didn't talk about that in any detail, but that's sort of the, the difference here. And then you see how good it is. This is like down to the 2,000%. So this is like really well fit. So we know exactly what the size of this planet is. Okay. We can't see it. Can't see the planet at all. But we have really good understanding of what its radius is. So that lets us do a lot of fun things. Okay. This is the first one ever detected by this technique, even before Kepler got there. This is, uh, oh, that's going to be hard if they're all up here. <laughs> this is HD 209458B. Uh, Why is that? Why does it have that weird name? What? They ran out of names. And these are all just names of the star. So the star is usually the HD 209458A. And then the first planet that they find is B, and then C, and then D, and so on. Okay. And so this one here is the first one found by the transit method. And this is, of course, an artist representation. And we'll talk about what's going on here. What is that thing? Is that water? It's a tail. Yeah. The tail, just like a comet. Yeah. This thing is so close that it's shedding its atmosphere. Okay, and we're going to see this over and over. So unfortunately, a lot of the exoplanets we're going to see, they kind of shock this. They were like, wait, what? I thought that we understood planetary science. And no, we don't. And so we had to revise our expectation. This one here is TOI uh, 849B. This one is 40 times more massive than the Earth. It's a hot Neptune. 
but it has no gas. So it's the size of a Neptune planet, but no gas. Fully rocky. It orbits, uh, it's in star in 18 hours. That is close or far from the star? Close. How long does it take Mercury to orbit? Hours, months, years? Mercury is a little farther than hours, but less than years. Months is the right order of magnitude. Okay? So Mercury orbits in months. This thing is orbiting in 18 hours. This is so close that the surface itself is 1,500 degrees. Okay? So the entire atmosphere has been blown off. And we notice when we go back to that, oh, okay. So this is the result of what happens to that after a really long time. Um, this one here is WASP-12b. This one's almost gone. It'll be gone in about 3 million years. So it's uh, being torn apart. It's a giant planet. And it's turning into this beautiful disk around its sun. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. Um, this one is really fun. This is one of my favorite planets. This is the Hawk planet. I wrote that. Don't don't quote me on it. So this is Ogle 205 B LG 390, I believe. I can't read it. Um, so this used to have, or this was forming like this icy, cool core. It's quite far from its parent star, but it doesn't have an envelope. And what they think probably is that it got big enough. It was ready to start grabbing gas from the disk and the gas was blown away by its star. And so it never got big. Okay. Any of these fun? No one likes them yet? This one's too close. So you might think to yourself that this is the exoplanet. It's not. Where's the exoplanet? Yeah, it's that hot boy right there. This is the hottest known exoplanet. Surface temperature is 4,300 degrees C. For context, what would that be like? 4,300 degrees C. Clearly hotter than Venus, right? How hot does stuff like metal melt? How hot does stuff like um, rocks melt? It's about 1,500. Metal is up there at about 4,000 to 7,000. So this is when metals are melting, okay? So this little thing here is glowing, right? Just like an iron poker that you stick in the fire for too long, this thing is glowing red, not just reflecting light, okay? So he's having a good day. That's Kelt, 90. Do the people are there? <laughs> no. Okay. But so far, we've talked about no habitable places, right? Okay. This one's fun. This one's a weirdo. <laughs> Um, this is hat key seven B. So the way that we want to remember this, we think about like this is a star and it has a disk where all the other planets are. This one is going like this. Okay. It's coming from above and it's tilted, and it also has a massively hot surface temperature, 2,200 degrees C. Okay. And you're seeing this like repeated. So the first time that we saw a lot of these exoplanets, they were massive. They were very large because they were the ones that we could see easily, right? It's easier to see a big planet because it causes a big dip in the light. It's easier to see a big planet because it causes a big pull on the star. So we saw those first. We started to see all of these ones that were really close and really hot. That's maybe not surprising though. You get closer, you get hotter, right? But they were mostly massive planets, Jupiter or, or larger, and massive, massive. This thing, 220 degrees C. We were like, what the hell's going on? Okay. Um, this one is Corot 7b. What's fun about this one? 
Oh, this is the first super. Okay. So this is the first time that we saw something that even looked similar to a rocky planet, but it's still not very good. Um, the surface is probably molten too hot, but it was rocky. Definitely rocky. Small enough, dense enough. Once you get the density there, you're like, well, it's not gas. It's not good. This one's really fun. This is Kepler 10b. Um, another rocky planet, but this one's surface is so warm. So this is like the artist conception. Um, this has like, it's pointing to its parent star on one side, so close. It's always showing, just like the moon, always showing the same face to its parent star. And so one side is really, really hot and um, is liquid magma. So it's got like a, a liquid magma, lava ocean surface. So like not a good place to um, go visit, except if you're Anakin maybe. Um, so this one is 1.4 times the size of the Earth. Very, very close to our size. And that's the real um, data right there. Pretty fun. Okay. Um, then there's like the Kepler 11 system. We've talked about only individual planets now. Kepler 11 um, was the first one where we were seeing multiple planets. And this was like big news in 2011. Hopefully, you're all alive then. Um, they announced that they had found a crowded and compact system. So here's Mercury, and this is to scale in the solar system. So imagine that this is the sun, Mercury doing this, Venus here. This whole system fits between them, between Venus mm -hmm. and Mercury. I got one, two, three, four, five, six planets. What are they doing there? <laughs> and this is the data. So you can see them with your eyes. So that's the normal star brightness. And every time it goes down, that's a planet. And sometimes you get really lucky and they're all right next to each other and they all go down together. Cool or not cool? Okay, one more Star Wars reference. Um, what's this like? No one's, no one's not seen Star Wars, right? Oh my gosh, all right. Yeah. It's not a requirement, but it is something you should do for fun. Um, so this is like, uh, if you watch A New Hope, you just have to watch A New Hope to get this reference. It's Tatooine. So Tatooine, you watch it for the first time. This is the 1960s, 1970s, and everyone's really excited because like they have these cool lightsabers. Special effects are garbage, right? They're like, they're trying their best. And it's all futuristic and really cool. And they like pan out on this desert scene. And in the desert scene, not only is there one sun, there's two suns. People are like, oh, that's so cool. Now, now you've seen enough sci-fi films that like that's not that impressive anymore. But at the time, they were like, oh, that's pretty cool. And we didn't really think about that because we have one sun, right? But George Lucas said, well, what if there was a planet with two suns? Before there was a planet with two suns. This is found afterwards. Okay. The fun part now is that as a planetary scientist, you get to watch sci-fi films and be like, oh yeah, that's that could be that could be real. Or the space. No, I hate that, right? And you can be the opinion in the class. So this one was uh Tatooine. In September 2011, the first planet was found around two suns. Now note here, this is about the size of our sun. So the way that this happens to be stable is these two orbit each other, just like Pluto and Charon. They're going around each other. And then Kepler 16b goes around that. Okay. okay, so we're going to take a quick pause so that our brains don't fry out. There's still lots of cool exoplanets, and we'll talk about ones that are more similar to us. But let's quickly finish the um, lecture tutorial that we had from Thursday. Any questions first? Sorry. Yeah. How does it become a sun instead of a planet like this? Why are there two here? Yeah, we'll get to that. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's 2011. Does anyone need a, you need the tutorial? All right, I, I can bring them up. Anyone else need one? Make sure you grab a friend. You 
Yeah, you can judge, you can quiz each other. What do you think? Oh. Oh, okay. 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 I thought you three were together. That's fine. They're going to be friends for yeah, yeah. Um, probably either drop it in my office, drop it in my in my mailbox, or we can find a time to like drop it here. But I think it'll make more sense to just do it in my office. Is that reasonable? Yeah. Um, I'll send. I'll send an email out that has a map for people. Yeah. Wait. So why don't you grab? Yeah. Two groups of three, why not two and two and two and two? So many groups of three. I just want people to share them because it's better if you balance the ideas off one another. You have the ideas in your head, and you never think them out loud, and no one ever says, huh, are you sure about that? And then you think it's right, and then you get problems. Or you know that. Maybe I'm looking at I try. Like I I try my best. I'm not good at it. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> the one that's mad at me constantly. <laughs> We're doing this one. Yeah. Oh, it's already out. Sorry, Ashley. Didn't mean to call you out like that. <laughs> The slides, okay. Uh, you want me to pull those slides up? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. Um, let me just grab. Oops. <laughs> they're here i promise it's even recent it's supposed to be is it on a different oh there you go okay no, it's week 14. Oh, I mean, it currently is week 14. 13, 13. Yeah, it's these ones right here. Right? Right, so this part here that we're talking about, so we're thinking about it in the context of like a fire truck coming towards it. It's higher pitch because every time that the sound wave comes out, it's getting compressed. And so here, the way we talked about light is that the difference between the distance between peaks, we call that the wavelength. When the wavelength gets short, okay, it looks blue. When it gets long, it's red. So on this side, we saw blue stuff that was like ultraviolet, x-ray, etc. compressed. So these would be small, shorter. These would be wide, longer. Right, you're lengthening the. Okay. 
And then we did this one. Oh. I hate my. I the, the question was down the party chat. I hated my. Back. Yeah, well, you have to know it. No, I don't. Legally speaking. I go to jail. You don't know? If you don't know it, I go to jail. Every day that you don't know it, I go to jail. One day. What do you say on the weekends? Right in jail. I don't know, it has so many fucking lots of issues. Did I do wrong? No, it is. Yeah. Oh, no, don't. No, please. I think. Yeah, I would. Oh, I just see you. Yeah, that's yeah, that was pretty relevant. Really. Well, I'm going to so look at this side. Okay. If it's on this side, it's in the middle of the red. Now, that's not in color, but you can't see that. But imagine red blue. Okay. So just that grouping just means that since the final thing, three friends together. They just happen to be in your picture. One of them's a little bit redder, one of them's a little bit blue. Still same grouping. They just all move left or right. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so so what happens when you start at this? Yeah, so, so let's say you, you're the observer, okay? Does this, what kind of shit is that? So, so you're thinking that I'm the star. Oh, okay. I'm saying this is the star. Okay? Okay, that's the star. Okay. So what kind of shift is that? Uh, yeah, left and right. Can you see a ship? No. Very good. Okay. So don't see a ship left and right. What type of ship is this? Yeah, which one of those? Good. What if I do this, right? So rotate Yeah, this is called an orbit, right? So as I do this, you can you can tell me as my hand is moving, or it could be blue and then red, and then blue and then red. And the amount is gonna change, right? Because as I move this way, this should be a small change. Whereas here it's moving the fastest away from it. Here it's moving most flat or side, so you get zero change. Big, small, big, small, big. So this is applying to, we can see these lines. 
right? And we see them go left and right, left and right. And sure enough, okay, so here's the, here's the motion. Yeah. And so as it goes around, we see blue shift and then red shift, and then blue shift and then red shift, and you can watch day in and day out. And we see that it seems to be going back and forth. Back, I see the star back, back. So that must be the plan. Right? Did I lose you? Or did I lose you? Yeah. Okay, let's go back. Okay. So we're just talking about planets. We're always be talking about planets. Okay. This is the intro to planetary science. <laughs> Okay, let's go backwards. Wait, Ashley, can you hear your partner here? Oh, that's so funny. Okay, so she's responding to you. Yeah, you can speak too. We can hear you. Wait, really? Yeah, I can hear you. OMG, period. Go off, partner. <laughs> yeah, the whole class can hear you. They heard the whole thing. <laughs> okay, wait, hold on. And this is recorded, so everyone will hear it later. Here, we could do video too. Oh, she can see you. Yeah. Shut up. What? I do, yeah. I wanted to get, so that's supposed to be able to follow, and I never figured out how to make it work. It's one of these buttons, yeah, no. I mean, I, I went to the training, and then it didn't work. It's hard to focus? Yeah. <laughs> Just a random voice, but it's the same audio. Really? Because they told me so that thing right there is supposed to be a directional microphone. That, like the little green thing. So this green thing has like I not only All right, yeah. So 
I'm gonna I'm gonna pass them out by name. Yours will only have like the light and uh, the student questions. <laughs> You have to prove it. You have to prove it. I, I can you couldn't compare it to anyone else. That would be cheating. Oh, you. you have to look at each other. Yeah, yeah, there you go. And it's all recorded. <laughs> okay, folks, how are we doing? It's it's Beetle, it's the name of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's red, it's in Orion. That's the red one in Orion. Mm -hmm. uh, so you see Orion's belt. And then there's a red one and a blue one. On either side. A blue one down here. This one's Beetle. The ones in the middle are what you want. What you want inside of Orion's belt is the nebula in Orion. So this is the region where brand new stars are produced. Okay. Parts normally makes good shit, but I don't know if I like this. Yeah. Okay. I tend to like go through them very Yeah. Thank 
Actually, I won't do it right now because we need to go back. Up. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Um, okay, folks, let's jump back in. Let's talk about really cool exoplanets. Okay. Questions on that? That might be important. Okay. Um, this one's fun. This is 55 Cancri AE. Um, this is the planet there. Color is, of course, fake. Um, this one's really fun because here's a 55 Cancri A, and there's 55 Cancri E. It's 25 times closer to its star than Mercury is. Um, it likely has a rocky core, and it has water. Great. You should go there, right? Oh, well, not really. It's in a supercritical state. It means it's so hot that it's both a water, it's sorry, it's both a liquid and a gas. So it's like a steam planet, but it's like a boiling hot steam planet, not like a relaxing weekend steam vacation. Okay. And when they look at the density, people looked at the amount of carbon here and they were like, wow, this is so carbon dense that it's probably made of diamond in the middle. And then other people said, that's the wrong way to interpret it. But I like to believe that it's made of diamond. Because they haven't figured it out yet. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be on the side of the diamond believers. Mm -hmm. And then in like 10 years when I'm wrong, you'd be like, oh, I'm an idiot. But right now, maybe I'm right. Okay. So that's Cancri E. For context, this is how big the Earth is to scale. And this is Cancri E. So much more massive than the Earth. But it's all concentrated into something that's almost you know comparable size. Um, this one's super fun. And this visualization, I don't know who they paid for this, but it's it's perfect. Okay. So you think to yourself, oh, this is vacation, right? No, no, no vacations yet. Okay. So this is HD 189773B. So in addition to the atmosphere moving at like 9,000 kilometers an hour. Just not pleasant. Um, this is a hot Jupiter. So its atmosphere is 1300 degrees. Oh, that's supposed to be a C, sorry. Um, 1300 degrees C. That's really warm, okay? There's silicate in there. So when I say the word silicate, you think sand, but sand at 1300 degrees becomes glass. So this is like, if you were standing there or you're like on vacation in your little ship, this is like if um, nine nine thousand kilometer an hour glass shards were flying directly to the side. So the the visualization I really like because you see these like beautiful shapes and everything. We saw that when we saw Jupiter. We saw this really beautiful like cloud structure because the winds there are quite fast as well. And the purple color comes from the silicates inside of the, the chemical composition of the atmosphere itself. And you know, maybe it'll look like that, but you're definitely not gonna go there though. But cool, right? This one's fun. Okay. And then we have um A218B. This one's fun. Twice the size of Earth, eight times the mass. Water was found here, but again in a superheated state. So here you could go swimming um, if you wanted that. <laughs> so dry suit not acceptable <laughs> melty boy if you go here okay so let's go to a place we give a shit about right so let's talk about things that look like us because that's all we care okay this is kepler 22b artist conception and it has really uh they're, <clears throat> they're gratuitous here right because they put like clouds and 
some green surface. Yeah, we don't know that, but we're going to talk about why we don't know. So this is called the Kepler-22 system up here. So there's a star, Kepler-22. And there's a little green patch here. And the green patch is an oversimplification of an incredibly complex topic. Okay? They call it the habitable zone. This is one of the worst things that we've ever done to the American public. Because then we get to say, oh, it's in the habitable zone. It must be habitable. What does habitable mean? Yeah, habitable just means that you could live there. So when I say the word habitable, usually I say, you know, this place is inhospitable, right? That's the opposite of habitable, inhospitable. So here, this green region, people say, well, you're far enough away for liquid water. It's, it's cool enough that it's um, not boiling. And it's hot enough that it's not freezing. So that's the inner edge here is where you keep going and then the water will boil. And then you go too far and it freezes. So we think to ourselves, well, we need liquid water. And so we put this little green space. And we say, that's all you need. The gross oversimplification. Why? Because I look just down here, okay? And I see that Venus, right on the edge. Venus habitable? No. Venus having a really hard time. And Mars, it's in the habitable zone. Is it habitable? No. So this is maybe not so good a, a term. But if it is the same size as the Earth, in fact, it's a little larger, we can go through all of that fun stuff that I made you do week five, six, seven. We say, hey, it's maybe two times larger than the Earth. What things do I know about it? Does it have an atmosphere? Probably, because it could hold on to that atmosphere. And its interior, is it dead or is it still warm? Probably still warm, which means it probably has volcanoes and volcanoes are probably creating more atmosphere. Okay, so this is how they made that really annoying picture that I said they were a little gratuitous. They know how big it is and they understand planetary science well enough to say, well, if it's slightly larger than the earth and it's the right temperature for water to exist, it probably has a thick atmosphere. Now. Where are they gratuitous? The clouds and the green. We don't know. It could be a large Venus. It could be yellow and awful, right? <laughs> we just don't know. Okay. This one's really cool. Um, this one is uh, Kepler-186F, and this one is even more gratuitous, right? But what did they do here? They got the liquid oceans. They got like fake continents that they just went to town. And they have like tectonic features. No, this is a lie. Um, they do point out that there are other planets in the system, which is good, right? This is F. How many other planets are there? Other planets would be four at least, yeah. F is the B, C, D, E. Good. And uh, it's got clouds. That's probably a lie. We don't know. But it's in the habitable zone. And yeah, that's the only thing that they like to shout. So next time you see New York Times uh, object found in the habitable zone, you say, well, I don't even know if it has ozone that would protect us from being habitable, you know? Okay, yeah. So how do we know that it's rocky? Because we can't see it, right? Yeah, how do we know it's rocky? So it says Earth-sized. What does that mean? There are two things that I mean when I say Earth size. Yeah. So same mass, good. And same radius. So radius and mass, if they're the same, then the composition has to be pretty similar. Because if I made that same amount of material out of gas, it would be much larger. Right? Or if I made it all out of metal, and no rocks, just metal, then it'd be much smaller. So depending on how much mass I have to play with, what I build it out of will change how big its physical size is. What about the temperature of that star though? Like what is that star hotter than Earth? Yeah, so that's another question. So we don't know anything about the star. 
But they, what they do is they, they, they change how far away you are to say, well, if it's a, a weaker star, then you can be closer and it's in the habitable zone. And if it's a hotter star, you're farther away. So they do that like this. And um, this is to scale. So in fact, it's a much weaker star. It's an M-class star. It's a paltry boy. But they make up a majority of all stars in the universe. And, uh, you know, that's a size comparison, which is like pretty cool. Right. Now, if you brought it here, obviously uh, the whole thing shrinks down to within this size. Um, so it kind of puts into perspective this idea that, like, okay, well, being that close to your sun only matters when you have massive sun like we do. But we have a big boy sun. I think this one's a big sun. Not really in this term. You know what I mean? Okay. And there are the rest of them. All of these would be deemed uninhabitable because it's too hot. I might come back to that idea. Um, this one is the closest match that we have so far. So to your point exactly, this one has an almost identical star. It has an almost identical year, and it's only slightly bigger. So if we're going to find something that looks like us, again, very gratuitous, I don't know what they did here, um, that, that would be the one that we would look for life. So you might be thinking, OK, let's not even go to Mars. Elon, take me all the way to this one. And is that going to happen? No, because this one is a thousand light years away. Okay, so it would take millions of years to get there. Okay, because <laughs> we don't go that fast. We're very slow, human beings. Okay, this one is fun. This one in the middle is a version that we don't have in our solar system. We don't even really have an analog to think about it. This is a Kepler 11 and a half. So on the right hand side, you know, this one, this is Neptune. You know, this one, that's Earth. This is like what we call a, a gas dwarf. So you have gas giants. And like, what if they like didn't really grow that much? That's this guy. Have fun. <laughs> so we don't have any in our solar system, but they exist a lot outside of our solar system. Okay. Well, why don't we have it in our solar system? Luck, design, I don't know. Good question. Um, this one's fun. This is HR 5183b. And this one decides that it wants to live really far away from its star. And then it gets real close and it goes all the way back out. So this is the orbit of um, 5183b overlaid on our solar system. So here it's uh, it, it acts like a comet, but it's a gas giant. Mass. So it comes in comes closer than, say, Jupiter would be, and then it goes all the way out. Okay? So that, that you're like, well, okay, that's kind of weird. Like, comes close to Jupiter and then goes out. Maybe it freezes a lot. It's got nothing on HD 80606b. Okay? So this is a simulation that we've done about what we think the conditions are on HD 80606b. So this is actual data from a model. that They fit to brightnesses. Okay, the reason why we can do this, because you have a star and it's going to pass behind the star. So you're going to see light reflected off of that towards us. We're going to use that information to get one side of the planet. We say, well, why don't we just do that all? Well, no one else does what HD 80606E does. And that is this. It thought it was a comet. Okay, or, or lived its own life, and then it decided I really want to hang out with the star. And it comes really close, and then all the way back out. And then really close, and all the way back out. This is a massive, massive planet. Okay, acting like, uh, acting like a, a comet. Okay. Make sense? We don't have an explanation for why this happens yet. I know you're not happy. Okay. This one's fun. This is Trace 2b, the darkest exoplanet that we know about, collecting only 1% of all light that falls on. Is this darker than charcoal? I don't know. What, uh, what is it? <laughs> Weird. <laughs> fun stuff, right? So, so far, anything you can think of, we have one. Um, you've seen this one before. So, so far, we've talked about a lot of single planetary systems. There's multiple planetary systems. Here's multiple directly imaged systems. Um, four massive planets. There's a debris disk in here from where a planet was either forming and was destroyed or is leftover debris. 
Um, this one is really fun. <clears throat> so these are the these are two planets. They orbit in the same system. This is Kepler thirty six, and they're so closely spaced. When they are at closest approach, when they're passing one another, they come within 1.2 million miles. And you say, well, that's really far. Until I tell you it's only five times farther than the moon. So if you like having a moon partner show up and then disappear. So this is not orbiting them. This is orbiting their parent star. So it'd be like every year, or multiple times a year, potentially, you have this massive thing. And keep in mind, the moon is tiny. It's like a sixth of the size. So imagine an object four or five times bigger than the moon shows up once a year and <laughs> flies away. You're pretty cool. <laughs> okay. This is the first one. And this is the first planet that we ever found. And we found it around something called the pulsar. Now you don't know about a pulsar because I haven't talked about them yet. But essentially when a star dies, it can either just like sort of sputter out, be really dramatic, and it can shed its exterior and be very violent, and it can turn into basically a lighthouse. So this is pulsating star, PSR. It has all sorts of numbers. Um, that's the first place we found a planet. But what does that mean? What's the implications? It means that even though the star died, the planet still died. Kind of weird, right? No, not weird. No one cares. Okay. And then this one is PSR also around a pulsar. This is B162026b. This is the oldest planet. Look at that number. What's that number similar to? The age of the, of the universe. That's only 1 billion years after the whole universe. Okay, and it orbits two little things in here. One of them is another pulsar. That's that, that one, and that's a white dwarf. These are both totally dead stars. They're not doing any more nuclear fusion. They're just hot, it's cooling down forever. This guy's just like, <laughs> so I don't know. Maybe there's people on it. I don't know. Okay, and so far we've talked about, so now we've talked about multi-planet systems. We've talked about multi-star systems. We've talked about um, planets around dead stars. What are we missing? Everyone's favorite nightmare. So, so these are planets that don't have a star. They got formed. They got into a little altercation in their solar system. And they got kicked out of the solar system. And they're just drifting forever. Isn't that cool? <laughs> we think they exist. They're probably out there. Uh, we haven't seen any recently, but you know, we'll wait them down to see them. Okay. Okay, so I, there are so many more, but I don't have enough time in all of the world. So all of the of the three methods we've discussed, which method could detect a planet in an orbit that is face on, sure. which means viewed from above. So for example, if this is the star here, the planet goes this way. Okay. Which of these techniques, the astrometric, the Doppler, or the transit? You know when you're ready to vote. Let's vote on three, two, one. Okay. Anyone want to defend their argument? Lots of twos. Lots of threes and ones. What are each one of these again? What is the transit method? Right, so I'm thinking about this light and I put my hand in front of the light and it goes down. So necessarily, for this one here, can I have, if I have the star and I have the planet going around it like this, will that work? No, I need it to pass at least a little bit in front of the star in order for this one to work. Okay, so I know it's not transit. What about this one here, Doppler? What does that do again? Or change in wavelengths. Change in wavelengths, yes. Yeah, so these lines are moving back and forth. Okay. If I'm orbiting like this, 
that pores are away from you. If I, if I orbit like this, no. So it needs to be in our line of sight. I need to orbit like this. Now imagine I can go through my own hand. <laughs> like that. That orbit is the only one that will work. I can tilt it kind of like towards you. Once it's tilted this way, then I don't see anything. So the only one that'll work for this type is the astro astrometric. And this is watching the star wobble as it moves through the source or through the galaxy. Okay. Okay. So here's all the things, the fun things we found. We found periods, we found shapes, we found densities, masses, um, compositions. And importantly, this is how they're distributed. Or at least this was, I should update this. So it was like four years ago. <laughs> um, so here you have math or the average orbital distance. So close and far. And here at the bottom, you have eccentricity how close to a circle it is. So you notice that Neptune, not very eccentric, the Earth, not very eccentric, Jupiter, Mars, sort of circular. Mercury's got a little bit of an eccentricity, squish circle. But all of these, these guys are crazy, right? Up here, these are the ones that are coming in from way away and coming really close. And it seems like that's mostly what we're finding, right? So most of them have smaller orbits than Jupiter. Most of them are elliptical. Okay, that's weird. Is this a selection effect? Is this because of how I'm looking? So plants at small distances can pull better, right? So that might explain why I found these ones over here more than I found these ones over here. Also, when the farther out here, it takes a long time. So that's a long period that I have to wait and watch. And if I don't watch for 20 years, then they don't see them, right? Pluto goes around once in 300 years, something like that. And we're not watching for 300 years yet. We have like 10 years left, okay? So these ones up here, bias. There's probably just as many, okay? Just cuts off. <laughs> we haven't watched enough yet. Okay. Now, the question about these elliptical orbits, that's weird. I'm going to figure out why that is. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, you just saw everything. So let's just go to here. So most of the uh, detected planets have masses greater than the Earth. So there's the Earth, and this is the mass of all of the planets as of 2013. Why are they all big? Yeah. So easier to see. Easier to see big things. Why is Jupiter easier to see than Mars? Bigger. Okay. So same answer here. Another selection effect. Good. Um, here's the planet mass as a function of the, what did I put this as? Oh, okay. <clears throat> so this was before, I guess, 2015. And this is after Kepler got there. And spread it out a little bit more. These numbers need to be updated. Something like one in five stars that are like our own have a planet. Just at least one. Many of them have multiple planets and some have none. Unusual thing that we're not going to talk about in this class is that our star is a little bit unusual. A majority of stars that form, say, in our galaxy, the ones that we know about, they form in pairs. And they orbit each other. So that's the most common form is a binary. And some stars even form in triplets, all going around each other, having a really good time. Okay. So what are these planets like? Okay, well, we're gonna talk about all of the problems that we saw today, and we're gonna try and fix them. Any questions before we go? Yeah. Yeah, it should. Yeah, so everything that we talk about is, is this, there's a, a chapter on exoplanets, right? Yeah. There's a homework on explanation, right? Yeah. So all of that will come together. Okay. So for next, so obviously there's no class on Thursday. Um, enjoy your time with your families if you get to go home. And then, uh, oh, I forgot to do it. 
if you have time right now, maybe I'll, maybe I'll send her an email about it. Can you write down five topics that you wish you knew more about and then put them down and I will create a bonus lecture for you? No, you all want to leave. I should have done it at the beginning. I'll just do my favorite lecture. What? My favorite lecture is history of all time. Yeah, so there's one on Monday uh, after Thanksgiving, and there's one uh, during five months on the Why? Thank you. Okay, we're just going to send out a Google Doc. Don't write anything down. And then I'll work out. Monday, yeah. And uh, probably six, six thirty. Yeah. Yeah. Radio playing? Radio playing. Uh-huh. Just playing at whatever. Yeah. Shine the light at it. At it, and then I got all static -y. 